I want to introduce this evening uh, Dr. Dennis Carroll. We are excited to have him here this evening, um, and we'll have him here again on March 23rd for Catherine Arnold's talk on the Spanish influenza aboard the USS Leviathan in 1918, so it's a historical account. Uh, Dennis was a uh, senior officer and my advisor when I was the uh, administrator of the United States Agency for International Development under President Bush 43. And we became not just uh, colleagues but friends and I trusted his judgment because I don't know a lot about health. I learned a lot over time, <laughs> dangerously so in some respects. But uh, we went through the, the uh, flu scare because there was a, um, a, a book that came out, The Great Influenza by John Barry. We had him speak, John Barry speak here at our first uh, annual pandemic summit five years ago. But at the end of the book, it says that we're going to have another pandemic. This is published in 2004, and it was 2003 or four. and it, Pre President, book read the book. President Bush read the book for his summer reading, and he got upset. And he, made, he bought a, a, a carton of the books and made everybody read it, all of the cabinet level uh, people and the deputy. I was a deputy level, so we all had to re read it. And it scared me, I have to say. And then I said, Dennis, we, we don't have a lot of money. We're going to get some money from the White House to prepare the rest of the world. But Dennis, I appointed as the head of the flu uh, task force while I was the aid administrator preparing for what did happen actually in 2009. The good thing was, the bad thing was, 1.8 billion people got the flu in six months. The, the good thing is the death rate was unusually low. So you don't need, probably even remember it. If it had been high, there wouldn't be a lot of, there would be a lot of you who wouldn't be here tonight. Let me put it to you that way. Um, Dr. Carroll is an infectious disease expert. He recently retired from, as director of Emerging Threats Division of USAID. During his time at AID, he led the agency's response to avian influenza, as, as I just mentioned, and the West African Ebola epidemic, and oversaw the agency's implementation of the emergency, Emerging Pandemic Threats Program, which was uh, carried out in 30 countries across Africa and Asia. He previously served as the Senior Infectious Disease Advisor for the U.S. Uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He was responsible for the initial design and development of President Bush's malaria initiative, the PMI, which President o Obama continued when he was president, and it's being continued now by President Trump. Uh, if you have questions, please write them on the cards, which the ambassadors, have you passed them out yet? You're going to? Okay. Okay, and, and just pass them to the to the aisle and we'll pick them up and then when we have our discussion after Dennis makes his presentation and I'll let him explain what he's going to talk about. But I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm sure you will as, as well. Thank you, Dennis. Andrew, Andrew thank you. And um, I've been here before and I know that you start off every um, presentation uh, at Texas A&M with a howdy. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I know where I am now. Um, do I have a clicker? Oh, here we are. Good. Look, the title of, of this talk is about megatrends and thinking about the 21st century. As Andrew said, the last several times I've been here, we've talked largely about emerging viral threats. We've talked about the H1N1 pandemic. We've talked about Ebola. Uh, we've talked about uh, very specific um, biomedical challenges that we face. And what I want to do is open the aperture. Because as we go into the 21st century, there are a lot of very interconnected, interwoven um, challenges we have over the course of this century, which really are being propelled forward by a limited number of mega events that are very predictable, that we can understand them, and ultimately get some insight into how we might be able to uh, address these potential threats. So I'm going to try and open up the aperture. Um, we will talk a bit about um, viruses, but we're gonna talk about a much larger constellation. We're talking about the world our grandchildren are gonna be living in. Any child who's born today, this is their world by the time they end 80 years from now come 2100. So we're talking about between now and the year 2100. 
But we can't, of course, miss the 800-pound gorilla um, that's in everyone and everyone's mind. And it is about the coronavirus infectious disease um, event in 2019. And what I wanted to do was just to use two slides in some way to reflect on some of the observations that were made yesterday in a panel that uh, Andrew hosted that was an exceptionally well done introduction to what the current status of this particular threat might be. And I just want to just say, what do we know about this virus? And the first thing I want to point out is that we know less than we should. Um, and it's not atypical in the midst of an emerging event. Information is scarce, misinformation is in abundance, and trying to make decisions um, in the midst of that is always a challenge, and they're always imperfect. Um, but we know at least some things about this virus. We know um, how infectious it is, it's, and we know with increasing understanding of what might be its relative um, public health impact. Uh, so we are learning things that it is a virus that will largely um, infect and pose a medical health challenge to people who are older than 50 or 60 years old. We're seeing that uh, it is also um, people living with pre-existing conditions. This is very different than an influenza pandemic virus, which largely impacts the young and the healthy. So this is a virus that's the older populations with compromised immune systems or, and people with other existing cardiovascular, diabetes, whatever it might be. Uh, we also know that it's less deadly than its cousin, SARS, the severe adult uh, acute respiratory syndrome virus that emerged in 2002 and 2003. Um, that killed about 10% of the people that it infected. Um, but it's more likely to be more infectious or more deadly than the seasonal flu, which has a, a mortality rate of about 0.1%. That means um, for every 1,000 people that infected that you're likely to uh, see one of those die. We're looking at something in between the two, and right now the numbers suggest about 2%, 2.4%. They may come down, they may go up, that's part of the imperfect knowledge that we have right now. Uh, what we also know, however, that it's a very efficient transmitter. Unlike that virus um, that Andrew was talking about a few moments ago, the H5N1 avian influenza virus of 2005, incredibly deadly virus, 60% of the people who were infected by that died, but virtually no one got infected because it was a very inefficient transmitter. This virus is very efficient, uh, and it's equivalent in efficiency to other pandemic viruses. So we can look at a sizable percentage of the population um, likely to be infected by this particular virus. Um, and what we also know, quite obviously, is no longer contained in China. While this virus emerged in December, became a very hot topic in early January, uh, was declared a um, public health emergency of international concern about a month ago by the World Health Organization. All eyes were on China in terms of an extraordinary, unprecedented effort to contain this particular virus. Very few people in public health expected it to be successful, but what we can be appreciative of is that that extraordinary effort really disrupted the spread of the virus and at the very least gave us another month the world another month to prepare for the possible um, introduction of this virus into countries around the world. What should we be concerned about? Well, the first thing we should get concerned about is that even though we had that month of preparation um, opportunity, we didn't necessarily take full advantage of it, either at the federal or state level, or internationally, our ability to work with countries uh, in Africa that have very little capacity for public health. We're limited, and countries that are in the midst of war, the Syrias or the Yemens, are going to be hugely impacted by this particular virus, and we didn't have a plan B for how we're going to respond to that. Um, we also uh, and that's because we are concerned about the spread into Africa in areas of conflict. 
And this is the last point I'm going to make. This is a, an enormously problematic issue. This is an emergent virus in the spring. It is a novel virus for us to be dealing with. It's a family of viruses called coronaviruses. This is the seventh known coronavirus to infect people. This particular virus, the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus that periodically, typically around May or June, sweeps out of the Saudi um, Peninsula, and the SARS virus, and four other viruses which are coronaviruses that we largely associate with the common cold. These four viruses are part of our seasonal landscape. They are coincident with influenza viruses. They come in the fall, leave in the spring. The question is, will this virus behave as SARS did, which is after it swept out and moved around the world disappeared and never returned again? Or will it behave like the seasonal flu virus and the MERS virus, which is part of a cyclical annual um, viral threat? We should not be overconfident come May or June if this virus begins to disappear. We should use this as another opportunity to prepare Public health rule number one is that you hope for the best. You hope that this virus, if it does disappear, come May or June in concert with a seasonality, you hope it doesn't come back in the fall. But you also have to prepare for the worst and anticipate it might. And you need to use those months to do the kind of preparations that will make America and the world safer. So this is just a, a, a footnote. Emerging viral threats are real. We'll come back to them in the course of my presentation. Um, but what I wanted now was to shift gears and go back to this issue about are we ready for the future? Are we ready for the next 80 years on this planet? And what I want to do is ask, are we ready in terms of our global health vision? How we understand the risks and challenges for global health that will dominate our lives over the course of the next eight decades. And what I wanted to do was to talk about future trends, trends that are predictable and understandable. What are their likely consequences of these trends? And then lastly, what are the implications for global health? And towards that end, what I wanted to do was to talk about six megatrends. These aren't the only megatrends out there. But these are six profoundly influential trends that are likely to play themselves out in ways that will impact our daily lives, our children's daily lives, and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren's daily lives to come. And they are population change. We'll talk about that. Changing demographics, urbanization, climate change, land use change, and a trend that isn't a trend but it is certainly a reality, and that is transformative technologies. How do all of these come together, and what do they mean for the world we live in for our future? So let's take each of these one by one. Population change. What I'm going to show you is a global map, and it's a map that basically is an active portrayal of the changes of population dynamics around the world starting in 1950 and going all the way out to the year 2100. And what you'll see is populations increase. You'll see the map expand. And where populations decrease, you'll see the map contract. And I'll play this a couple of times. But what we do know from our own experiences is that the 20th century, from 1950 to 2000, was a remarkable period of population growth in Asia. You'll see that played out very dramatically. But pay attention to what happens in the 21st century. Very different. So you'll see up in the top left-hand corner the clock ticking away. You'll see over the rest of the world China exploding. No surprises as we move into the 21st century. But as we move further into the 21st century, China begins to contract. 
Much of Southeast Asia begins to contract along with Japan. But look at Africa and the subcontinent of India. And when we talk about global population, we now have about 7.8 billion people on this planet. Think about that. That is not normal for this planet. A hundred years ago, if we were talking at the height of the 1918 pandemic, there were 1.8 billion people. Think about it as a species. It took us almost 300,000 years of our total existence as Homo sapiens to hit the 1 billion mark. And in 100 years, 10 decades, three generations, we racked up another 6 billion. By the time we get to the end of this century, we're going to add another 5 billion to that number. And that is principally going to be in sub-Saharan Africa and in the subcontinent of India. So when we think about population pressures and the consequence of population pressures, the 21st century is not a replay of the 20th century. Because what we also see is those countries that expand in the 20, 20th century, they're now beginning to contract. Look at Russia. Russia almost disappears. I mean, it is a country that is continually contracting population-wise. Uh, the Americas are largely stable. Let's play this out a different way. And we have a series of bar graphs, again, going from 1950 out to 2100. And you'll see that Asia and Africa, pay attention to those two bars. As we get out to the middle part of the 21st century, Asia begins to contract. Africa continues to zoom along. So as we think about how we meet the challenges of the 21st century, population pressures in Africa are going to be the dominant. And we'll talk about what that's going to, we're going to talk numbers in a little bit. But the world of the 21st century population-wise is dramatically different. And with population come enormous, enormous changes in the world we live in. So the world's biggest countries by the 21st century. Think of this. The first will be India, not China. In fact, China will contract by about 4 billion people by the end of this century. But look at number three, Nigeria. Andrew, when you were the head of OFDA, Nigeria had a population of about 150 million people. Look at that. It's stunning. I like to go down to the very bottom one, however, which is Uganda. Those of you who have ever worked in Uganda, the total population of Uganda today is 44 million people. 214 million people are going to be living in Uganda. Think of 214 million people living in a quarter of the size of Texas. There are enormous challenges. And look at the list that's up there. The United States is number four. But then you have DR Congo, Indonesia, Tanzania, Ethiopia. Africa is the dominant space for increased population around the world. So with populations, of course, come changing dem demographics. And this is a very fast map. Just let the colors fly by, because what the colors are telling you is that the world's getting older. That in the 1950s, we were a young people. I remember the 1950s, and I was very young at that time. But as we move into the 21st century, collectively we're getting older. Even in those regions where we're seeing more people, we will see they're getting older. Let's go back to Uganda. I'll use that as sort of the poster child. This is Uganda today. As I mentioned, just about 43 million people living in Uganda today. By the year 2100, 214 million. But when we look at the demographic changes, the medium age in currently is 15 years. By the time we get out to 2100, it's almost 40 years. But even more interestingly, the population above 55 is equivalent to the entire population of Uganda today. There are huge implications when we think about global health. How does a society prepare for a population of older citizens equivalent to the entire size of its current population today? Are they prepared for it? Are they thinking about it? But let's go to another country 
Thailand, where if you looked at that map showing population increase and contraction, Thailand was among those populations that were contracting. So that we see in 2019, there are just about 70 million people in Thailand. But by the time we get out to 2100, there are 46 million. And when we look at their age distribution, we're watching again the medium age getting older and older and older. So the health challenges that the populations of tomorrow are going to deal with are fundamentally different than the health challenges they're dealing with today. Are those populations, the professionals in those populations, preparing for that dramatic change? And what does that dramatic change mean? Today, when we talk about what are the dominant health issues, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, we largely talk about infectious diseases. But when we talk about these moving into the 21st century, sorry, what we're looking at, it's the dominant causes of death are lung cancer, road injury, a largely um, non-communicable diseases. And in fact, the diseases that we're preparing the whole health systems in these regions to deal with today are going to account for about 10% of the mortality of tomorrow. Extraordinary transition. Not only are there more people, but the health profile is profoundly different. But the systems that are required to deal with that transition, are they being adequately prepared to deal? Are the professionals that are being trained, the institutions that are being built, are they thinking about these changes that are underway already? And it's not surprisingly that when we look at that transition of projection, even as we go out to the year 2030, that low-income countries, about 20% of mortality. But when we get out, we're due to non-communicable diseases. But when we get out just to 2030, for low-income countries, it rises to 52%. It's not waiting to the end of this century. We're seeing within a decade a fundamental transition to a completely different epidemiologic profile within these communities. So lifestyle diseases are closely associated with changes and increases in GDP. Population, demographics, the next big mega trend is how we settle as a species. What do our villages look like? Well, our villages are getting pretty big. And what we're looking at, the mega cities of the world Again, what you're seeing here is a reflection of where are the most populous cities in the world. And what is striking about it, and we'll get into more detail, but virtually all of them are in sub-Saharan Africa or in the subcontinent of India. There are none in China. There are none in the United States or in the Americas. The megacities and all of the challenges that go with urbanization are in those places where urbanization is least developed, and the infrastructure is the least invested in. And so as we think about, again, Kampala, I told you the population of Uganda today is 42 million. By the time we get to the end of this century, the population of its capital city is going to be the population size of the entire country. Think about what that means, the urban infrastructure that's required to meet the needs. And it doesn't just happen 80 years from now. It's a progressive evolution in that direction. And you're going to watch this increase, but we're not seeing a parallel increase in terms of investments or understanding about what these challenges mean. And this is a list of those countries. What I wanted to point out is that of the 20 most populous megacities in the world, 13 will be in sub-Saharan Africa. Three will be in the subcontinent of India, and the rest will be in the Philippines. Kabul will be a megacity. It's an extraordinary world that will be at the end of this century, and it's going to be an extraordinary trajectory as we move towards that. 
what we also know about urbanization, it doesn't just come with a cost of population living on top of each other, it's all the, the quality of their lives. And we know that just one metric is ambient air. And associated with that are diseases coming from poor air quality. Anyone been to New Delhi lately? Anywhere in India? Well, if you have, first off, you'd be lucky if you could see more than a mile. And it's because of air pollution. And it's not surprising that when you look at these maps that talk about future premature mortality associated with diseases as a direct consequence of air pollution that's driven by urbanization, that India lights up like there's no tomorrow. But we're seeing sub-Saharan Africa also beginning to light up as well. These are disease burdens as part of that transition to non-communicable diseases, but they're environmentally driven. So, environment, let's talk about climate change. And you may remember that the Paris, Peace, the Paris Climate Change Accord, Paris Peace Accord, that takes me back a little ways. Um, the Paris Climate Change Accord had signatures committing themselves to reducing the elevation of global climate to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That was the target, that was the goal. The current trajectory, and in many parts of the world, we've already blown, blown by this, is four degrees Celsius. We've already exceeded the targets in many parts of the world of the Paris Climate Accord. And anyone who pays attention to what's happening in Antarctica and the Arctic are extraordinary examples of just the distortion and climate profiles that are going on. And we know that with those events are huge collateral consequences. We'll come to that in a moment as well. What we also know about climate change, the elevation of temperature dramatically, both CO2 and temperature, and maybe I'm speaking to the wrong crowd here, but this is about agriculture and crop production, that with elevation of CO2 and with temperature, we see a significant drop in protein yield per hectare of crops developed. Huge implications for food security, but it also has few, huge implications for one of the next megatrends I'm gonna talk about, which is land use change. Because to just stay even with the current population as you get less yield per hectare, you're gonna to have to expand the amount of hectares that are under cultivation in order to just maintain protein stability. And this goes back to what's happening in the Arctic and what's happening in Antarctica, which is the elevation of sea levels. And in a report that came out just about a month ago, revisiting what just, I put up here four examples, uh, Dhaka, Bangkok, Jakarta, uh, and Bangladesh, uh, I'm sorry, the Pearl River, so over by Hong Kong and um, Guangzhou. And what we're looking at is dramatic, just by 2050, this is 2050, dramatic displacement of land that is currently being lived on. And what it translates into, we're looking at climate change refugees for those countries, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Thailand, of greater than 30 million that are gonna be displaced from their current areas of habitation because of the rising seawaters. And when we look at it globally, it's gonna be over 100 million climate change refugees driven by the rise of sea water, a direct consequence of the events that are happening in Antarctica and Arctic region. And this brings, again, enormous challenges to global health. So, land use change. This, to me, is the most extraordinary of all. Probably it's because the one I was least aware of 
and the impact of it is so incredibly profound. Land use change largely has to do with measuring changes in ecosystem as a consequence of our human footprint. And what you have here on the left is the average uh, change in land use cover um, over the course of the past uh, projecting out till the 21st century. And what we talk about, and this is where it gets really interesting, with that land use change comes changes in habitable species range. Every species on this planet has a defined ecosystem that it lives in. We represent an extraordinary example of a species that moved out of um, East Africa and have now able to establish ourselves anywhere on this planet. And up to Elon Musk, he'll have us living on Mars um, before the end of this century. We are incredibly adaptive, but many species are far more fragile than that. And as their species range becomes compromised by the land use dynamics that are going on in this planet today, we're looking at significant disruption of species survivability. But let's talk what's driving land use change. And this one, this is an interesting one. Because in a paper that came out, um, again, this past year, looking at the relative contribution of different agricultural practices, because the single biggest driver of land use change is, in fact, agricultural production. And when you look at their relative contribution, you look at um, poultry or pigs um, or eggs, Ultimately, what you look at is they're all relatively inconsequential along with rice and wheat and corn. It's the last two that are, account for 75% of all land use change on this planet. And it is cattle and it is lambs and sheep. They're profoundly changing the planet. And think about it, that's today as we move into 12 billion people and think about where those billions of people are coming from, Africa and sub-Asia, the land use challenges there are going to be even more profound. So let's talk about impact. You get the land use change. What's the impact and what we can talk about basically is species extinction. As I mentioned, land use change is directly correlated to the disruption of habitable species range. And when we think, I'll give Uganda as an example. By 2100, 18 to 29% of the species, anyone who's been to Uganda, 18 to 29 of the species that you're familiar with that are out there, these are land-based species, will be extinct because they will not have habitats that they can survive in. And when we think about it globally, of the 5.9 million terrestrial species, terrestrial species, almost 10% will be threatened with extinction by land use change by mid-century, 30 years from now. We're increasing our population we're increasing our need to keep that population healthy so they need food security, good nutrition. And as we do that, we are having an incredibly negative impact on the world we live in. And we also know, and this is where I first became familiar with land use change as a driver of risk, it's the single biggest predictor of emerging viral diseases that when we go back and look at all of the factors that potentiate a coronavirus spilling out of a bat population into a human population, the single biggest predictor is land use change and its proximity to wildlife. So it's no surprise as we've looked at our footprint of land use going up, we've looked at the impact on um, the ecosystems 
that are in play that over the course of the last half century, we've seen a steady increase in spillover of novel viruses from wildlife, which is the principal reservoir of every single past virus and new virus. This we know. And the frequency with which those events, the frequency of the coronavirus, COVID ID, 2009, came as no surprise to anyone who works in this field. It was an inevitable consequence. We didn't know where it was going to be and when it was going to be, but that it was going to happen sooner than later was inevitable. And there will be a follow-on to this within the next few years. There'll be another virus driven by these dynamics. Our future landscape, this is what our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are going to be dealing with. So those are the big megatrends. But I wanted to also talk about another dynamic that's underway, and that's tra transformative technologies. And we know that over the course uh, of the last several hundred years, there's been successive advances, technological advances, which have transformed the lives that we live. The most recent, of course, has been in the course of this century, the automobile and air travel, transportation, has profoundly changed the world we live in. And when we think about, and also in the last 30 years, has been information technologies. The 20th century has been dominated by two extraordinary events, mobility and communication and information management profound differences from any other time we've had as a species. And when we think about what that translates into, no surprise to anyone here, the rate at which we're looking at air transport moving people around the world is increasing exponentially. All regions are now actively expanding the numbers of populations moving. What it means, as we saw this, we see this repeatedly now, and the coronavirus is a clear example that an event that happens anywhere in the world can be on your doorstep tomorrow. We are closer, more intimate. This global community has become a global village by virtue of transportation. But what we also know is that the internet has not only, we're not only more physically closer, we also are more intimate with each other in terms of our ability to communicate across vast distances where time is no longer a relevant issue. We live in a different time and space. It's an extraordinary time that has transformed our lives immeasurably. And it's, as we all know, it's a double-edged sword. There are advances we've seen with information technologies, and we've also seen the underside to what the consequence. Misinformation flows just as fast as good information. And people's ability to move and create a true global experience where everyone can become more intimately familiar is also a recipe for being able to move microbes from one part of the world to another part of the world. But this is the defining technologic revolution of our species. And it's what we're sitting on the cusp of now which is, this is a big bang moment. And it's where we have the interfacing between machines, data, and people. Artificial intelligence. We don't even appreciate just how profoundly the powers of artificial intelligence are going to transform our world. And quite frankly, we already take it for granted when we talk to Siri or Alexa that it's a norm. We are on the cusp, if we think we've seen something now, we're at the very, very lower end of what will be a hyperbolic curve over the course of the next several decades, not the rest of this century, because we're looking at transformation and what we know about pattern recognition, our ability to be predictive and the power of prediction is extraordinary. Um, we're looking at neuromorphic computing to make us faster, more insightful, more resilient. We're looking at issues around machine learning, where big data becomes tiny little challenges. And then we're looking at the issue of autonomous mobility. All of these things are just changing everything about our lives. And 
they could provide some opportunities for solving problems that we're creating for ourselves. We're not going to not have 10, 12 billion people by the end of the century. But we can be a lot smarter about how we generate energy. We can be a lot smarter about how we manage water. We can be a lot smarter about how we preserve and protect the integrity of oceans. And we can be a lot smarter about how we understand and predict and prepare for extreme weather events, which will become more and more the norm because of climate change. And we can become a lot more effective in managing the illnesses and the health conditions that challenge our people because artificial intelligence will give us a power we've never had before. Believe in that power because it does have the opportunity to begin to impact on some of the very ne most negative aspects of the trends and dynamics that I talked to you about. We're going to have more people. We're going to be more urban. But our agricultural and livestock production can be smarter, more efficient. Our urban settlements can be much more ecologic. Our energy generation can be much more sustainable and climate neutral. The opportunities are there. The question is, how do we harness artificial intelligence to make all of these things a reality? So that's the 21st century. What are the, what are the consequences? Well, again, there are going to be more of us, particularly in Africa and the subcontinent of India. We're going to be older with new health and lifestyle challenges. As a global population, we're going to be urbanized with elevated air pollution and issues, challenges around water and sanitation. We're going to be hotter with extreme weather. It's not just the heat. It's the extraordinary weather patterns that we're looking at and will continue to look at over the course of this century. And collapsing habitat loss with mass extinction. That's the world we're moving into. But transformative technologies have an opportunity to bring us closer together in space and in thought. And they also have an opportunity to revolutionize our ability to deal with those problems. But it's harnessing that power is going to be critical. So can our global health vision meet these challenges? That's the real nux of the question I have as a global health practitioner. Because when we think about changing demographics, it's not a single sector. We're looking at health, urban planning, labor, just to name a few. When we're talking about urbanization, water, sanitation, energy, transportation. When we're talking about climate change, it's energy, agriculture, health, environment, land use change. Again, what we're looking at, all of these challenges are inherently multi-sectoral. And we live in a world where we specialize in stovepiping and isolation of sectoral domains. We have to begin thinking in a multi-sectoral way because these problems are inherently multi-sectoral. And we should take a lesson from what has come out of the attempt to respond to the challenges around emerging infectious diseases over the last two decades. That was inherently understood not to just be a health, human health issue. The genesis and the solution of that health issue required a partnership with the wildlife and the agricultural community. And the One Health movement that came out of that experience has given us some understanding of what does it take to turn stovepipe systems into more horizontal, integrated, interactive. And that allows us, if we think about where the One Health concept came from, which was animal diseases, human diseases, and environment, and the intimate interrelationships that connect those, and the need to build generations of leaders coming out of institutions like Texas A&M, that they can think about these problems not in a stovepipe way as a veterinarian or as a physician or as an environmentalist, but you begin to understand the connectivities and the connections so you have a shared understanding of what's underlying the problem with a quick step towards having a shared vision to what might be the solutions to the problem. Look at that One Health paradigm. It's an extraordinarily complicated um, 
Many of you have worked on that, and you know that it's fraught with all sorts of liabilities. But it is a challenge which has been embraced, and it is being worked with. We need to take that understanding, and as we move into this century, recognize it's not just about emerging viral diseases and the One Health paradigm about animals, people, and environment. We need to appreciate that when we talk about weather, when we talk about food, when we talk about all of the issues that we've just walked through, healthy urban settlements, thinking about aging populations, looking at challenges about population pressures and growth, the impact on um, uh, ecologic systems. How can we better manage those where they're not managed in a silo? We need to understand they're part of a revised One Health vision that is inclusive of the animal, the human, and the environment, but we also need to take into account trade, financing, urban planning, energy, just to name a few. And as institutions like universities at Texas A&M, you're the ones that are responsible for training that next generation of leaders. Are they beginning to understand problems in a way that's a shared vision? So when they go into their professional careers, they're going to be able to solve the problems that we haven't. And can they harness the power of artificial intelligence to help them solve those problems? Are we training them to really to become harnessers of AI in a way that makes them powerful and makes them powerful solution solvers? All of this is challenging. We have a world out in front of us that we can talk about the liabilities. But it's our world. It's a consequence of who we are as a species. It's good to remind ourselves we're just one of 5,924 terrestrial species. Homo sapiens, we're just part of it, even though we act like we're all of it. We have to begin reimagining who we are on this planet as part of a shared ecosystem. And then how do we build that next generation of leaders who are going to go into government, who are going to go into academia, who are going to go into the private sector, who are going to go into their communities and become the change agents that are going to make the world a safer place? A challenge, and it's one that raises the questions for this institution, do we have the policies right? Are we promoting the kind of policies that will allow for an integrated, holistic approach towards being able to manage these realities, because any one of these realities really speaks to an existential threat, whether you're talking about pandemic threats or you're talking about the collapse of ecosystems. We are talking about a shared global risk. And do we have the right policies? Are we advocating policies which speak to this in a way that policymakers and decision makers are going to be able to understand and translate that understanding into action. Challenges that are extraordinary. But with that said, we don't have to panic. All of these issues are solvable, but they're only going to be solved if we solve them. No one else is going to solve them. Or progeny will be part of the solution as well. But we need to come together as a species move beyond state borders, national borders, ge geographic boundaries, move as freely as some of our agents of concern. Viruses know no border. We always hear that. Well, we should, our ideas and our actions should know no borders either. So with that, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, the world is a complex one, but it's a glorious one. Thank you very much. Andrew, that's what I was going to talk about. Thank you very much. So let me um, argue with you a little bit, OK? Uh, if you take the uh, the population agent UNFPA estimates from 20 years ago, they estimated by the end of this century, 2100, 
there would be 50 billion people on the planet, not 12 billion, 50 billion people. If you look at all the estimates, I used to study them, it was horrifying. And they kept <laughs> this up, even though the demographers were saying, you need to re revise these because the population growth rates are dropping. And they, were, they kept dropping, and China instituted probably the most disastrous uh, uh, social policy of the 20th century, their one-child policy, because they now have 80 men, I'm, I mean 80 women for every 100 men, which means 20% of their men will never marry. And men do not behave the same way if they're single and they have no children than if they get married and have children. I don't want to go into that, but <laughs> there's a lot of studies on that too. Uh, Valerie Hudson, Dr. Hudson has studied this. So my, my first point is that this is not, um, this is the current state of where the demographic change is being projected. And let me just also yeah. change. When I was the, the, the agency in the world that has done the most in terms of family planning, voluntary family planning in Asia, has been USAID. In fact, that is one of the most successful programs. And I'll tell you one story. Uh, I am an Africanist. I've spent a lot of my career studying Africa and doing programs in Africa and moving a lot of AIDS programs out of Asia into, into Africa. And we had a, a famine scare in 2003. There was a, a, a crop failure. And, AI, and Ethiopia is one of my favorite countries in the world, but it has famines. It's the most famine-prone country in the world. And it had every two or three years it'd be a scare. We had to run in with huge amounts of American food to deal with it or we would have mass starvation, which none of us wanted to have. So I called in the family planning office when I was aid admin, and I said, you know, you've been running these family planning programs in Asia. The, the, the rates are dropping, the fertility rates, and they've dropped dramatically in Latin America. I mean, Latin America, fertility way down, with one or two exceptions. And that's because of the, these aid programs, to uh, family planning programs. So I said, why don't we move some of that money to Ethiopia? Because they have an average of six children per family, an average of six children. And I said, this is, they, they can't support these, this population growth. So we did, and I, I, without going to the argument, no one wanted to stop the programs in Asia, and I said, we don't have any choice. This is the amount of money we have, we're moving the program, we've been moving these programs in Asia for 40 years, and that's, it's time to change them. We had yelling matches, I, I, I didn't threaten to fire anyone, but I was very angry, I kept saying I want a 100% a increase, not 100%, from 2 million to 22 million. What's, what's that as a percent? 200 percent? More than that. Uh, increase in, uh, tenfold increase in the funding for family planning in Ethiopia. We finally did it. I went back to South Sudan for the independence celebration and I stopped in Ethiopia and the staff said, Andrew, we want to show you what we did for 12 years. They dropped the rate, of uh, the average rate, by one-third through this AID. And this was all done with the government of Ethiopia. We didn't force them to do it. But um, uh, it went from an average of six children to four children. It took 12 years to do it, but it was very successful. Uh, the use of uh, contraceptive devices, and I know there's some people opposed to that, but it's not a Catholic country, and I'm an Orthodox Christian. We accept contraception in the Orthodox Church, and the Muslims accept it as well. And so it dropped. Uh, in Ethiopia from six average size to four. This chart would have been much worse if we had not done that. So I, I think what we should be doing myself is moving the whole program out of a lot of countries in Asia into Africa right. uh, because of what you saw. But we can change it. We can change it. And I could argue on a lot of these things that projections are based on the current level of activity and knowledge and that can shift. Okay, but let me, let me raise the question of, you, you drew a connection, but not, you didn't, let's tease that a little bit, of the connection of the destruction of species of wildlife because of urbanization and because of population growth and all this, and infectious disease. So how specifically are those two things, con I know how they're connected, but I want you to say it to everyone. Well, I think as, as uh, many of you here know, that when we talk about new infectious diseases, largely all of those new things, they already exist. They're already in circulation, but they're largely in circulation in wildlife populations. 
And those wildlife populations have, over the course of their um, evolution, have learned to coexist with these particular viruses. This change in our footprint, whether it's due to settlements, whether it's due to agriculture, or whether it's due to projecting ourselves into uh, pristine areas looking for natural resources. We're bringing more and more people, and as we bring more people, we bring more of our animals into areas that are rich with wildlife. And we're seeing that those species of wildlife that um, are more adaptable to human populations, um, bats, rodents, uh, and anyone who's been to South Asia knows that uh, non-human primates have a, an enormous adaptive uh, capability. That those tend to bring with them, along with some other species, uh, those viruses which have been circulating but we've never seen before. So as our footprint increases, as we have these projections and interactions that we've never had before, that's why we're seeing on the average three to four to five new spillover events that lead to outbreaks and epidemics. And it's largely driven by that changing interaction where those viruses either jump into uh, a livestock animal and that acts an intermediary. Think of uh, the, the MERS virus that's um, uh, uh, associated with juvenile uh, dromedaries in the Arabia Peninsula. Um, or think of avian influenza, that uh, influenza is Poultry is a natural intermediary. Um, or they jump directly and think of Ebola or HIV, direct incursions into people. So 75% of all of the human diseases that have caused epidemics in the last 40 years are zoonotic, they're animal diseases. And they make the jump from animals to people, and then they mutate and they efficiently jump from one person to another. So that's the risk. 75% of all diseases in the last 40 years that we're confronting are zoonotic disease. They're animal diseases. Many of them, some of them are domesticated animal, but many of them are wildlife. And you've just explained that. So right. there is this connection and it's, it's it, and I, I believe, I think you're absolutely right that there are all of these interconnections and the big problem in development agencies and frankly in universities, I see it in every university is that people become economists or biologists or, and they focus on their discipline only. And they actually don't understand the other disciplines because it's very complicated and you can't understand all of them. We used to hire PhDs in AID and all these disciplines and we found out that when they, they, they were a problem because they didn't want to deal with the other disciplines. And so they started to only hire generalists who actually knew a lot a, a, a moderate amount on a lot of subjects and could start integrating different schools. And so that has actually changed the workforce in AI. Well, obviously I'm an iconoclast here. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, because I represent that population, like I think many in this room, um, that understand the complexities. Uh, you know, the beauty, of, the beauty of science is your ability to take a very complex situation and dis, um, disassemble it into its constituent parts and then understand how you deal with that. Right. And it's, the, it, it, it's a, uh, a core part of problem solving. And I would you know, just pick up on your point about USAID. I think it's an extraordinary missed opportunity that an agency, which is unique, it's the, it's the single entity on this planet that is built to deal with everything that I just talked about exactly here. Exactly right. Works with every single ministry and every constituency within the private sector that rather than deal with these things separately and independently, building a village, community, national approach towards linking and harmonizing all of this, creating smart kids living in a healthy environment with jobs and ecosystems that cause them to flourish. You know, AID could be at the center of that revolution. Absolutely, could, could be. Could. And, as in, and in some cases is, but it, it, it has not met its potential, and one of the reasons is people don't even, the United States don't even know what they've done over the last 50 or 60 years. Yeah. The Marshall Plan, by the way, was the beginning of the U.S. aid program, and it was wildly successful, as many of you know. Let me ask some questions from uh, the participants this evening. What is the mechanism for transmitting coronavirus from host 
it says victim, but to, from, from person to person. Coronavirus is um, one of a handful. First off, coronavirus designates a family of viruses. Um, you know, think of blonde people as one family, brunettes as another family. You have viruses that align themselves with certain characteristics which allow them to be understood to have a shared genetic profile. And coronaviruses, like influenza viruses, one of the things they share, these two separate families, is that they're transmitted, um, they're respiratory viruses that are transmitted um, through coughing, sneezing. And basically the virus, when it enters our body, enters our body by way of attaching to the upper respiratory um, cells of our respiratory tract. So that's how these viruses spread. You cough or sneeze, you inhale. Someone coughs and sneezes, you inhale, or you put your fingers to your mouth. It's, it's that oral respiratory transmission, which is very different than, say, Zika virus, which we're all concerned about a few years ago. That was transmitted by mosquitoes, by a mosquito bite. Or Ebola, that was transmitted by body fluids, the secretion in sweat, and people tending to sick and ill um, as part of their caregiving or preparing them for burial, they got infected because they touched those bodily fluids. So viruses are very distinct. That's why this virus is very easily transmitted because it's respiratory. And if I walked around this room and I was infected and I started coughing, a number of you would walk out of here. If I was an Ebola victim, you largely no one, because no one's going to come up and give me the kind of hugs and touching that right. would transmit that virus. Right. Exactly. OK, uh, how do you get people from industrialized countries to care about infectious disease that was principally a problem in the developing world? That is, the principal cause of death in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is not cancer or heart disease or diabetes yet. That's going to change as you, as you, we, by the way, we had a big fight over this because we produced a report called Foreign Aid in the National Interest, you may remember this, and some of the health officers, I had them in my office 18 times, they were so upset because we talked about exactly what you have up there, that there's going to be a shift in many countries away from infectious disease as a principal killer to chronic diseases like cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, and that the agencies should start moving into those, and they did not want to do that. But anyway, that's a different subject. We, we published the essay anyway, and it's there, and it, it's had some effect in some areas, but not as much as I had hoped. Well, let me just touch on that for a moment, because it's not an either or. No, it's Those not. countries are right. going to still be being besotted with infectious diseases. Right they will also have the benefit of non-communicable diseases. And, and as I said in my opening comments about the coronavirus, this is what's going to happen more and more frequently, that the people who are most vulnerable are people living with a non-communicable disease. They're living with a pre-existing condition. So you're going to see with increasing frequency infectious disease agents like this coronavirus that doesn't necessarily impact on healthy people beginning to have a disproportionate, out of size impact on the population at large because more and more people will be living with pre-existing conditions. So it's, it becomes, you know, we need to think of these as, a, I think of it as, a, you know, a, a two trains going down the same track in opposite direction. That in Asia and Africa, and particularly in Africa, we're going to see an abundance of infectious diseases as we see this surge in non-communicable diseases. And people are going to die with, have much higher mortality rates simply because of the pre-existing conditions. Okay. Um, one thing I've worried, I, I've wondered myself, and I guess we don't know, but you tell me we don't know. Maybe you don't know. Maybe something came out in the last week that I missed. Will getting if you get sick but you don't die from the coronavirus, and 81% of the people, according to one study, who get this COVID-19 that's circulating now, will have mild uh, symptoms. It will not be severe. 
14% will have severe symptoms and then 5% very severe symptoms. The question is, do you get immunity from getting the disease again in the future? We, we don't know yet, but um, you know, if you're a betting person, I would say the answer is you will get immunity. We don't know how long that immunity will last, but other um, viruses of this type, when you get exposure, you get a measure of immunity. But we also know that the cold, um, that is something that we are constantly, and it's not just the coronavirus that causes the cold, um, but we, we get frequent bouts of cold as well. So it remains to be seen. Typically, you see some measured immunity, mm -hmm. um, but we don't know how sustained that'll be um, or not. There are no other diseases, though, that would produce antibodies that would protect. Now, if you get the flu, it's not going to protect you against the coronavirus. Well, because, no, no, no. You won't see cross-reactivity right. or cross-families. Right. No, okay. No. Let me ask another question about technically and organizationally. How would you force or encourage a university to, any university, I don't mean just Texas A&M, to have cross-fertilization against these disciplines? Well, you already do it. And I'll give you an example. The first true One Health practitioner was, was a content. The One Health movement first came out of an observation made by the first epidemiologist, John Snow, in the 1840s, 1850s in London, who recognized that the urbanization dynamics of that industrial age were bringing village-level water and sanitation practices into high-density settlements. The industrial age was dependent on having high-density settlements. But you couldn't, as we saw with Jon Snow, who arced out cholera as a direct consequence of water contamination having to do with poor management of sewage. What came out of that experience is something practitioners in this university do already, urban planning. Urban planning is a quintessentially One Health example of bringing together multiple skills and sectoral capabilities to be able to deal with what it takes to have a healthy population living in a high density settlement. So we've already made it sort of a career directive for um, many. And I would say learn from the urban planning experience. How did they do it? And how would you adapt it to bring in smart energy? How would you deal with smart agriculture? How would you deal uh, with all of these a better management of land and ecosystems? It's, it's doable. Urban planning does it. May a thousand flowers bloom. Huh? Hmm. How will geological changes, such as volcanoes and earthquakes, affect these trends? Now, uh, this says they're going up. They're actually not going up. What's happening is people are moving into live in at-risk areas, which they didn't do before. They're right. moving, for example, in Bangladesh into flood areas, which they never did before. Uh, they knew there were going to be floods, but there's no other land, so they move into these areas that every few years there's a typhoon, and it completely, I mean, if they don't leave, they all no, die. But that's a consequence of, again, pop population, population growth. growth. Rates, exactly. That we're moving yeah. into ecosystems which are very fragile and we're being very disruptive. And we had this happen in this state. I mean, I did a report for George P. Bush, the grandson of pres our President Bush, who's the state land commissioner on Hurricane Harvey. And you all know that the state's population doubled between 1980 and 2020, 40 years. It doubled from 14 million to 28 million people. Guess where all those people were? In their metroplex from Dallas-Fort Worth down to Austin and San Antonio and then over to Houston and back up to Dallas again. That area is where all that growth is. The rest of the state's been losing population, actually. But this has been a massive increase. Guess what's happening? All the land that is being built on for driveways and roads and parking lots for all of these huge developments and, uh, and, and commercial establishments, that land does not absorb water anymore. It runs off, and that's why we're having so much flooding from these hurricanes. It's not because the hurricanes is more severe, it's because we have changed the 
land use planning, and there in Texas you can never talk about building codes. I mean, uh, we don't want to, I actually was told never use the word regulation in the paper, so I had to go back through the paper just so people would read it and not get upset and not put in anything about a building code. I, we have the third worst building code system in the United States, and yet we have the highest risk of, of uh, weather, not, not the number of events, but the damage from weather events in this state is the highest in the country. Huge amounts. I think 40% of all of the storms that cause more than a billion dollar damage are all in Texas. And yet no one wants to talk about building buildings better so that they can withstand hurricanes or flooding for that matter. Anyway, that's another subject. But that's the answer is people are moving because population growth rates take place and they're moving into areas not just in the developing world but here as well. Uh, can you make suggestions? We're going to end this because we're over the time, I'm sorry. Uh, are books and literature suggestions on these or similar topics? You have a couple of favorite books? What's that? Books for people to read about this subject. Are you writing a book, uh, Dennis? There are, I mean, there aren't books that I've read that look across all of this. There are individual books that look at it uh, on, the, uh, on the pandemic side, as you mentioned, yep. John Barry yep. uh, certainly did um, a superb book. There are reports that have been put out um, by various, uh, the World um, Food Program has put out reports looking at uh, these issues. These are largely scattered across different um, institutions and groupings within and outside the UN. Um, I'm not aware uh, of, a, of a book, but you know, I'm, I'm trapped in my Kindle. If it's not on my Kindle, I don't, I don't see it. Well, we have to end it this evening. We're over time. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.